I thought it was a little early. Good morning, Central Park. It is good to see you this morning. Those of you who are joining us on our live stream, it is good to see you as well. If you are a guest with us, thank you so much for being here. If you're a guest in the building or if you're a guest watching online, we are honored that you would join us this morning. Uh, my name is Jamie Early. I'm the student and young adult pastor here at Central Park. Uh, I am not Pastor Matt. Pastor Matt has taken a well-deserved day off. Um, one thing I've been thinking about this morning is um, making it through this season that we've been in. One of the reasons I've been able to do that is because of the people I work with, and I'm sure I'm going to catch grief for that. Um, for, uh, but I, um, we've been able to keep each other sane, I think, a lot of that coming at my expense, and I'm sure um, I will hear about this jacket that I'm wearing. I'm sure Matt will make sure that I know I don't need to wear it again, uh, but it is good to be with you this morning. We're going to be teaching out of uh, Second Kings this morning on King Josiah, and so I'm excited about the opportunity to stand in the pulpit and preach. So be praying for me. I'm, I'm uh, racked with nerves, as well I should be when you preach to God's Word. So join us this morning. Oh, a uh, couple of announcements. We'll be uh, in one service again next week, uh, 1030, uh, and then uh, we will get you information about what it's going to look like after the year turns or continues forward. We don't, you know, we, just, we, don't, we don't know yet. So thank you for your patience with us. Uh, over these last 10 months. Uh, it's been uh, a unique situation that no one, none of us have ever went through before, and uh, especially as church staff, it's something we've never done before, and so thank you for your patience with us. So let me pray for us. We're going to worship the Lord through song, and then we'll worship Him through the preaching of His Word. Father, thank you for your goodness and your kindness to us. God, we're overwhelmed by it. Thank you for coming as we have just come out of the Advent season, we're closing out the Advent season. Thank you for uh, your goodness and your kindness to us. Uh, God, even while we were yet sinners, you died for us, God, and, and you came for us, uh, uh, God, when we were undeserving. We love you. Be glorified this morning. I pray, King Jesus, that you would uh, quiet my nerves, God, that your word would be what is heard this morning, and your glory would be what is uplifted. I pray you be with Brother David as he directs us and leads us. Uh, to sing your praise through song, and God, that uh, people in this room and people who are watching, God, via the live stream would experience your spirit and be changed uh, by it. We love you, King Jesus, and praise you in your name. Amen. Good morning, church. It's a joy to see you today. Christmas Day was Friday, so what does that make today? Steve Perkle knows. Anybody else in the room know what today is? Weezer, do you know? The third, it is Steve, it is Sunday, very good, very good. It's the third day of Christmas. Ella, what did my true love bring to me on the third day of Christmas? Three French hens, followed by two turtle doves and a partridge in a pear tree. It is a good thing to see you today. Thank you for being with us. We're going to get another day of the 12 days of Christmas a week from today. You can start figuring that one out now, all right? Because once we get over past about sixth or seventh day of Christmas, it's hard to remember what my true love brought to me. This morning, we're going to begin worship singing from the angels, angels from the realms of glory. This great carol is one of three that was written or premiered, made its first appearance at a Christmas Eve service. Silent night, O holy night, and angels from the realms of glory was written for a Christmas Eve service in the early 1800s. The chorus is very appropriate for today. The chorus says, Come and worship. Come and worship the newborn King. The 12 days of Christmas mark the time from the birth of Christ to the arrival of the Magi, the three kings who came to worship the newborn King. Let's stand and sing together today. Angels from the realms of glory, wing your flight o'er holy earth. He who sang creation's glory, now proclaim Messiah's word. Come and worship, come and worship, worship Christ the newborn King. Yeah. 
Well, good morning again, church. We got to talking about that song in rehearsal, and uh, I told Brother Dave I had never heard that song until last year at Christmas. Um, I know, I know. I'm, that's you know that's why I listen to songs like uh, "Last Christmas" by uh, by Wham. So uh, again, thank you for the opportunity, church, to stand before you and preach. Uh, um, I am feeling the weight of this morning a little bit heavier than normal, and the reason I say this is because this space here, not just this pulpit, but this space here and these offices down the hall have been a war zone for 10 months. And what I mean by that is, I mean, we've been fighting this, this unknown battle of scheduling and canceling things and do you meet and what kind of restrictions do we put on our services. And it's just been uh, ongoing all year and exasperating at times. And so... Um, uh, all of us uh, have been carrying a pretty heavy burden this year, so thank you for your prayers for us. Uh, if you have your Bible, turn to 2 Kings chapter 22. We'll be in 22 and 23. Uh, if you have uh, in front of you your worship guide, if you want to get that out, there's a lot of, uh, I'm going to be in a lot of scripture this morning, so we put those notes there, that way you wouldn't have to flip uh, page to page and, and everything as we're going. So let me just read uh, verses, 20, uh, verses 11 through 13 of chapter 22 and 18 through 20, and then we will get going with what the Lord has for us today. So if you read verse, sorry, if you read verse 11, it says, when the king heard the words of the book of the law, he tore his clothes. This is speaking of Josiah. And the king commanded Hilkiah the priest, and Anakiah the son of Saphan, and Akbor the son of Micaiah, and Shaphan the secretary, and Isaiah the king's servant, saying, Go inquire of the Lord for me, and for the people, and for all Judah, concerning the words of this book that have been found. For great is the wrath of the Lord that is kindled against us, because our fathers have not obeyed the words of this book to do according to all that is written concerning us. And if you'll turn over to verse 18. But the king of Judah, who sent you to inquire of the Lord, so this is the Lord speaking, thus shall you say to him, thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, regarding the words that you have heard, because your heart was penitent, and you humbled yourself before the Lord when you heard how I spoke against this place and against its inhabitants, that they should become a desolation and a curse, and you have torn your clothes and wept before me. I also have heard you, declares the Lord. Therefore, behold, I will gather you to your fathers, and you shall be gathered to your grave in peace, and your eyes shall not see the disaster that I will bring upon this place. And they brought back word to the king. Let's pray real fast, church. Father, thank you for the opportunity to stand and proclaim your word this morning. Uh, thank you for uh, Matt giving me that, that, that opportunity. I pray, Jesus, that... Uh, I would glorify you through what is said in this place this morning. Uh, God, I am um, I'm terrified at the opportunity that is before me. And so I pray, Jesus, that you would, uh, that you would uh, uh, quell any uh, of my own words, any of my own fears, Jesus, and that by your Spirit you would speak clearly your word to your people and speak clearly your word to maybe those people who are here who are watching God that need to um, hear the gospel and be drawn to you for salvation. God, you just speak this morning. We love you, King Jesus, and we praise you in your name. Amen. Well, what a year it has been, church. This time last year, you know, we were, we were uh, writing up all our, our punny ideas about 2020 and seeing things from a new vision and, and seeing things with glasses. Even the camp our students went to last year was about 2020 vision. And uh, then we got here. Uh, we had continents on fire, an overactive hurricane season, social and racial tensions, political chaos and insanity, as I've never seen before, not to mention the coronavirus, which has touched us as a church personally, specifically in the last couple of weeks. But even in the midst of all that, God hasn't flinched one time. He hasn't worried or wavered. Praise him for his unchanging nature, sovereign over all things. I love what Matt has said 
multiple times from this platform that since this all began, there is not a molecule in this universe, not even a virus, that God is not sovereign over. And so we praise him for that. Uh, this story holds a little bit of a place of sentimental value for me. Um, if you want to know why, you can ask me after church, but there's a little YouTube video uh, that has a connection to this uh, to this message that I was engaged in a few years ago. But as I've grown in my faith, it has become more of a, a convincing and challenging passage. And so I hope it does the same for you. So today we're going to look at God's Word and our response through the eyes of the King Josiah. So here's a quick, and I mean quick, I'm going to blast through some historical background of where we are in this section of the Scripture. Uh, so we find the story of Josiah in the midst of tumultuous times for God's people. David had ruled following Saul per God's decision. Following David, Solomon led the kingdom in a prosperous time, and then he turned away to worship other gods. This led Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, to lead, the, to lead northern Israel into de- independence from Solomon's son, Rehoboam, and Judah. So the kingdom had already been divided at this point in time, and they went into institutionalized idolatry. This ultimately led the northern tribes into exile. During this time, there were relatively good kings ruling in the gaps between wicked kings, uh, with Hezekiah and Josiah, who we're talking about today, being two of the best. Sin continued to accumulate with Judah ending up in exile as well. So both the southern and the northern kingdom are in exile. And even in the midst of all this, God remained unchanged. His royal line had not come to an utter end. Nothing can frustrate his purposes, and God stood as he stands today, ready to forgive those who repent. Nothing can frustrate his purposes, including a worldwide pandemic. And so if you know anything about the Old Testament, you know that those stories, it's good kings and bad kings, it's, uh, it's judgment from God and then repentance and then falling back into sin again. It was this pattern that the Israelites seemed to fall in that, that we have a tendency to repeat maybe in our lives as well. Josiah, the king who we're studying today, was eight years old when he began to reign. Eight, eight years old. Um, those of you who have kids, I don't know if I'd want my eight-year-old reigning a kingdom, but he was the last good king of the Davidic line prior to the Babylonian exile. Habakkuk and Zephaniah were possible prophets during this, uh, during Josiah's reign. He had complete devotion, Josiah did, to God's approved course of conduct for his life. He obeyed the Mosaic stipulations as he came to know them, following the example of David. And so Josiah wanted to repair the temple, so he sent, um, he sent people up to, uh, he sent the secretary up so that money for the repairs could be, could be counted and gathered. And while the secretary was there, he found a copy of the Torah and it was read and bought, brought back and reported to the king. And so let me just read some of the passages that would have been in this, in this piece of the law that was found. Um, the Lord saw the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every intention of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. We find that in Genesis 6, 5. I am God Almighty. Walk before me and be blameless. Genesis 17, 1. And the Lord said to Moses, How long will you refuse to keep my commandments and my laws? Exodus 16, 28. You shall not bow down to them or serve them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing steadfast love to thousands of those who love me and keep my commandments. Exodus 20, 5 and 6. For I am the Lord your God. Consecrate yourselves therefore and be holy for I am holy. Leviticus 11, 44. And the Lord said to Moses, how long will this people despise me and how long will they not believe in me in spite of all the signs I have done among them? Numbers 14, 11. And now, O Israel, what does the Lord your God require of you but fear the Lord your God and walk in his ways? And that's part of Deuteronomy 10, 12, and 13. So you can see all these commands that God is giving. Hey, you need to be holy. You need to do as I command. You need to love me above all things. And so this is found, and it's reported back to the king. And although it is not until the 18th year of his reign that the new king begins to take action concerning the apostate condition of worship in Judah, for it had been about 57 years that Judah had been a in this apostate state. But Josiah was not aware of the Lord's demands. But once he became aware, so once he heard some of these very laws, he responded. And like Josiah, we should have a response. And so this morning, I want to look at three responses that we see from Josiah and hopefully that reflect in our own life. 
So if you have your, uh, your worship outline, the first response that we see from Josiah is an emotional response. We see an emotional response from Josiah. And you can see that in verse 11, when he heard the words of the book of the law, which, and when we say the book of the law, that's going to be the first five books of the scripture, the Torah. Uh, and so when he heard that, some of those scriptures that we just read, it says in verse 11 of chapter 22, he tore his clothes. There was an emotional response that Josiah had to hearing God's word. And so we see in the scriptures many emotional responses. We see clothes torn in this particular instance and other instances. We see individuals sitting in sackcloth and ashes. And even our Lord himself had emotional responses that we see in scripture. So it's not a foreign concept to us. Here's a couple of real life examples of what this means. Uh, after my senior year of high school, my football team made it to the semifinal round of the football playoffs. I was a drum major in the band at the time, and we played at Owen High School, and we got stomped by Cadillac Carnell. Carnell Cadillac Williams was on that football team that beat us like a drum, and I got back to the bus and cried like a baby. I mean, I was, I was torn up, and, um, and even, even today, I, I shouldn't say this, but Etowah got beat in the state playoffs the other day, and I was thrilled to death that they got, that they got beat. Um, I'm still, still harboring that, those bad feelings. Uh, shamefully, after Auburn lost the 2013 national championship, I laid on the floor and wept like a baby. I mean, that's just the truth of the matter. Uh, here's a couple pictures um, that will give uh, a little bit better example of what's going on. Do we have those? We have those pictures? All right, so you're, you're thinking, yeah, of course, Jamie, hockey picture. Uh, so this is after the Predators lost the Stanley Cup in 2017. You can see those guys are, are tore up. So you can see a physical response um, to what it is. This is an emotional response to something. And then the next picture is a guy by the name of Trevor Linden. Um, uh, the Vancouver Canucks were not meant to even be in the Stanley Cup finals in 1994. But they lost to the New York Rangers, who had been searching for a Stanley Cup after 54 years, and he is down on one knee in the corner of the ice after getting to a Game 7 and losing. So you can see emotional responses. It's not something that are foreign to us. All of us probably have stories of emotional responses in our lives. These can be from pain, anger, frustration, or, or desperation. It's, it's kind of a universal language. And so Josiah, in this passage, demonstrates with immediate contrition, so he has a sorrow, a, a regret, a, a guilt that he expresses by lamentation and grief. Josiah's response, it wasn't the result of the environment around him, so like those two pictures was kind of the result of the environment around them. For me, that football game that we lost my senior year, it was kind of, my emotional response was kind of a result of, of the environment around me. Uh, now, that probably contributed to Josiah's emotional response because he saw all the sin, and so it, it, it tore him up emotionally. But uh, Josiah responded to the Word of God. So it wasn't necessarily a response to the environment, although that might have had a, a play in it, but it was a response to the Word of God. Uh, John Stott is quoted as saying this, The truth is that there are such things as Christian tears, and too few of us ever weep them. And so an emotional response to God's word or anything that, that deals with God's holiness and our sinfulness is something that we should experience, and maybe none of us experience it enough. I, I would like to recommend to you, if you want to take notes, there's a sermon titled Brokenness, so this is the title of it simply, by uh, Vodi Bauckham, uh, which builds on this idea. It's a fantastic sermon. Highly recommend you. You're probably thinking, yeah, you're free time, Jamie. You listen to sermons. Uh, but it's a fantastic sermon. Uh, Vodi is a tremendous orator of God's word, an apologist, and he builds on this idea of brokenness. And so here's a question for us. Does the word of God break us? Does the word of God break us? Now let me just pause for just a second here before I move forward. This quote by John Stott, he says, there are such things as Christian tears and few, too few of us ever weep them. I'm not saying that you necessarily have to physically weep over over reading God's word or over an acknowledgement of your sin, but there, there should be some sort of emotional idea. Does the words revealing of the sin in our lives lead us to an emotional response? And if not, why? Why doesn't God's word lead us to some emotional response about who we are in light of him and his truth? Let me close this section with just uh, a statement. And uh, this is probably going to be extremely unpopular, but it needs to be said. 
If we will weep over whether our candidate is in the White House or over a football game or any game for that matter, but will not weep over the truth of God's word, then that is a problem. I know that's an extremely heavy statement and probably very unpopular, but we will weep over everything. I mean, I just told you straight up honestly, I watched a bunch of boys play a football game in 2013 and they lost and I cried over it. And I remember after that, so the, the second part of that story after that, is I just, I mean, it's the middle of the night, the kids are already in bed, and I'm laying on the floor and I'm saying, God, please don't ever let me respond to a football game like this if I can't respond to you like this. I was torn up by the fact I was weeping over a football game. So, so but if we won't weep over the truth of God's word, that, that may be a problem. So, we have an emotional response to God's word. Josiah has an emotional response. He, secondly, he has a physical response. These are some action steps we can take. Now, this is from... Uh, 2 Kings 23, 1 through 20, I'm not going to, uh, I'm not going to uh, walk you through all of those, but we'll hit some of those high points as we go through this. One of the greatest uses, John Piper says, of Twitter and Facebook will be to prove at the last day that prayerlessness was not from a lack of time. Once Josiah was read the book of the law, he had not only an emotional response, as we saw, he tore his clothes, but he had a physical one as well. And so let's look at some of these things that we can see in chapter 23 of what Josiah did when he responded to God's word. So he burned vessels made for Baal and Asherah. He deposed priests who had been appointed to make offerings to false gods. He burned the Asherah and beat it to dust. He broke down houses of cult prostitutes. He broke down the high places set up for false gods. He burned chariots and pulled down altars. He cut down Pillars, because they would, they would be build pillars to these false gods and worship at these pillars. He executed the priests leading apostate worship. So you can see there's a lot of physical response that Josiah goes through once he reads the truth of God's word. And let's see it in a couple other places in scripture. Matthew 21, 12 and 13, it says, Jesus entered the temple and drove out all who sold and bought in the temple. And he overturned the tables of the money changers. In the seats of those who sold pigeons, he said to them, It is written, My house shall be called a house of prayer, but you make it a den of robbers. We know the story well. With whip, Jesus goes in and turns over the temple tables. So he had a physical response to the truth of the word. He was the word, but he had a physical response to it. We can see this uh, uh, a book back in Scripture from where we are now, in 1 Kings 18, 39 and 40. This is after, um, this is after Elijah was on the mountain. And, you know, remember they were having a, a quote unquote a competition between Elijah and Baal. And, and Elijah was calling out, you know, yell louder. Maybe your God is asleep, you know, and they were cutting themselves. And here's what it says. So Elijah calls down God. God brings the fire down, licks up the offering, takes up all the water, burns everything up. And when the people saw it, they fell on their faces and said, the Lord, he is God. The Lord, he is God. And Elijah said to them, seize the prophets of Baal, let not one of them escape. And they seized them, and Elijah brought them down to the brook Kishon and slaughtered them there. Okay? We don't usually, you know, usually we'll stop at that portion of Scripture because there was a physical response. Here's these false gods, and Elijah said, no, 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 we're done with this. And then in Isaiah 1, 16, it says, Wash yourselves, something physical. Make yourselves clean. Remove the evil of your deeds. Turn before my eyes. Cease to do evil. So there's a physical response. We can clearly see this in the scriptures. It's not a foreign idea, and it shouldn't be foreign to us, church. Now listen, I'm not telling you. Please do not misunderstand me. I'm not telling you to go home and burn down your house, okay? I'm not telling you to go do that. But what does our physical response need to look like? And this is going to be, this is going to be where, that's why I said action steps, because this is going to be something personal for each of us in this room. What is it going to look like? What do you need to tear down or destroy? For me, can I just be 100% honest? I've written here. It's this right here. My time on social media and my phone in general. 2021, I've got to get off this thing. We have a tendency, first thing in the morning, we'll roll over and that's what we'll get on because we want to see, you know, we want to see who updated on Facebook or Twitter. And so I want to tear that particular idol down. And while the physical response that we see spoken of here uh, destroying things, uh, maybe our physical response should be one of action. So actually getting up in the morning. Who in this room is a morning person? 
Okay, there's a, a couple or a couple morning people. Yeah, Ty, you are definitely a morning person, buddy. That is without question. A few of us are morning. I'm not really a morning person, um, uh, but maybe we need to get up in the morning. Maybe we need to turn off the TV at night, and, and maybe the night times when you meet with the Lord. So turn off the TV at night and get yourself into God's Word and into int- intimate conversation with King Jesus. Maybe it's going to serve at um, a mission opportunity. That could be local or international missions. Maybe that could be going and raking somebody's yard. There's some sort of physical response to the reading and hearing of God's Word. If you want some direction about how how to do this going into next year, you can feel free to join uh, us and our students. We're going to walk through a thing called Year in the Word, where we're systematically going to walk through God's Word using uh, the F260 Bible reading plan that we've used here at the church before. And I think Pastor Matt is going to do something similar. So we're, we're going to be engaged in the Word this year so we can read it and see what our response should be. But there should be physical response uh, to reading God's Word. So maybe your physical response is this. I don't think any of us in here have a golden calf that we're physically looking at in our home that we need to tear down. But there should be some sort of physical response like Josiah had to God's Word. So we have an emotional response. We have a physical response. Uh, and lastly, Josiah, he had a spiritual response. Second Kings 22, 18 through 20, we read that just a moment ago. That was the Lord responding to Josiah's response, saying, hey, he responded well. He was penitent, as it says. I, I, that, that word penitent, uh, humble, his heart was humble. If you've ever seen Indiana Jones in the Last Crusade, the word penitent is, uh, actually plays a very prominent role in that movie because as Indy is going and looking for, uh, he's going and looking for the, um, the cup of Christ, penitent, that's one of the things. Only the penitent man shall pass. And so his heart was humbled. And so the spiritual response, once we are confronted by the word of God, we respond to it. And whether you acknowledge it or not, church, every time, Every time that we encounter God's word, we make a decision about how we will respond to it. Every time. We make a decision. From a spiritual perspective, we can respond in two ways. And so, if, if you're, you're writing this, so the point number C is spiritual response. And then two ways that we can respond spiritually is we can respond with hardness. We can respond with a hardness of heart. Uh, This is six points from a a guy by the name of John Glass. He's the senior pastor at Cropwell Baptist Church in Pell City, Alabama, which a good friend of mine and his family attend this church. But he he, he laid out these six ideas uh, that I think match this hardness of heart. People embrace their sin. They they deny their sin. They fall into this self-hatred mode. Oh, I'm a sinner. I'm an awful person. They're angry towards the one who tells the truth. They blame others. For their sin, so it's not their responsibility. Or they seek out non-biblical self-improvement. So all these things, this, this hardness of heart response. And you're thinking to yourself, but Jamie, I, I, don't, I don't fall into any of these categories. That, that's good. If you don't fall into the, any of these categories, that is good. But you may still be responding with a hardness of heart if we des- deny the severity of our sin. If we deny the severity of our sin, we may be falling into a response of hardness of heart. Now, we, we have a tendency in the Christian uh, thought process, we, we put sins, this is a super bad sin, but this is not a very bad sin, and um, that, that's just not the case. We would be just as guilty of sin before God if all we did in this life was tell a small white lie as we would if we were to embezzle money or commit adultery. And so we can't deny the severity of our sin. So if we do that, or if we choose worldly endeavors over Christ... That's responding in a way that that hardens our heart. Or if we make spiritual decisions based on our own personal or worldly preferences. So it's like, I'm going to make a spiritual decision for God, but I'm going to do it based, God, not on your word, but on my preferences or on what the world says. So if that's the case, be careful. Be careful there. Many of you are probably familiar with the group Casting Crowns, and they sing a song about this called Slow Fade. I think it was from their second album. And in the song, Mark Hall sings a line that states, Black and white has turned to gray. So you may not see the hardness of heart, but it could easily come. Beware. The Bible says that pride comes before the fall. And so in a similar idea, beware that those lines begin to blur. Don't let that happen. There is no gray area when it comes to God. It's very clear. 
That's why even in Revelation we see hot and cold. We don't, you know, lukewarmness is what God spits out of his mouth. So we respond in hardness, or if granted, we can respond in repentance. So if granted, we can respond in repentance, which is what, how Josiah responded. Charles Spurgeon says this, Learn this lesson, not to trust Christ because you repent, but trust Christ to make you repent. Not to come to Christ because you have a broken heart, but to come to him that he may give you a broken heart. Not to come to him because you are fit to come, but to come to him because you are unfit to come. Your fitness is your unfitness. Your qualification is your lack of qualification. And so it's just this response and the fact that God is the one that cares for us. Josiah responded with tenderness and humility. He didn't try to explain his sin away or deny its severity or put the blame on someone or something else. I'm just now thinking of this as I'm reading that word. You know, we'll, we'll often get mad on the road because someone is driving slow in the left-hand lane. And instead of putting the blame on that person, we should put the blame on ourselves for getting angry about that. Now, should they be driving the left-hand lane? No, they shouldn't. But should we get angry about it? No, just go around them and, you know, smile. And if they're on their phone, just, you know, nod in, in acceptance. But don't try to put the blame on someone or something else. Josiah felt the weight of the law of the Lord and what the denial of that law looked like. He responded. And so let's look at four ideas of what a repentant response may look like. Number one, you you turn to God. Josiah would have turned helplessly to the mercy and love of God. And today, for us, that means turning helplessly to Christ. So when we respond in repentance, turn towards Jesus. That's what repentance actually is. The Greek word is metanoia, which means change mind. And so literally, you are changing your mind from the things that are not of God to the things that are are of God. You're moving your eyes from the things of the world to Christ. And so we're turning helplessly towards Christ. Secondly, we can pray for cleansing. It is fitting that Christians ask God to do this. You can see this in 1 John 1, 7 through 9. Christ has purchased our forgiveness. He has paid the full price for it. But that does not replace our asking. That does not replace our asking for cleansing or for forgiveness. It is the basis for our asking. It is the reason we are confident that the answer will be yes. So secondly, not only do we turn to God, but we pray that in his mercy, God would forgive us and make us clean. A friend of mine by the name of Michael Bozeman once said, if you don't know repentance, you don't know Christ. Because repentance is an ongoing thing that just happens in the life of a believer. You are constantly, as you see things that you're turning to that are not of God, you are constantly repenting and turning towards God. So we pray that God would would cleanse us or would forgive us. Thirdly, as we respond to repentance, we confess the seriousness of sin. We must join with God in condemning sin and confessing the depth of corruption in our lives. This is why Josiah's response is so important for us. He doesn't in any way try to justify the sin of the people of Judah. He simply confesses it. As I said earlier, he'd been the, the, the country of Judah had been living in this apostate condition for about 57 years, according to some of the commentaries that I was studying. So they were in the midst of this. Josiah didn't look at God and say, it's their fault, God. I, I, see, I see your word here. They've had the opportunity to follow it. Uh, it it's really their fault. You, you know, I, I'm king now, and, and I acknowledge that, but it's, he didn't say it at all. He simply confessed it. Oh, God, here are the sins of the people. Please forgive us. And finally, we plead for renewal. We seek more than just forgiveness. We seek renewal. We want to be passionately committed to being changed by God. John Piper says it this way, Being a Christian means being broken and contrite. Don't make the mistake of thinking you get beyond this in this life. It marks the life of God's happy children until they die. We are broken and contrite all the way home, unless sin gets the proud upper hand. Being broken and contrite is not against joy and praise and witness. It is the flavor of Christian joy and praise and witness. And so we plead for renewal. And that's what, you know, Josiah went before the Lord broken, tearing his clothes. God, please 
please forgive us. And we can see that again. In verse 11, he tore his clothes and the king commanded these people, go inquire of the Lord. You know, ask him about the book, the words of this book. For the wrath of the Lord that is kindled against us, it is great because our fathers have not obeyed the words of this book to do according to all that is written. And so they went before the Lord and the Lord responded saying, because the man who has sent you responded to me in humbleness, he is not going to see the great judgment that I'm going to pour out upon this people. God was kind because Josiah confessed his sin. He saw the word of God. He had an emotional response to it. He had a physical response to it. He tore down all these high places and he had a spiritual response to it. He was contrite. He was penitent. He was repentant. And God forgave him. He was kind to Josiah. So if you have your Bible, turn to uh, Psalm 51. I know this is not in 2 Kings. Um, A little background history of this passage, if you don't know. Psalm 51 is David's plea, confession, prayer to the Lord after he was confronted about his sin with Bathsheba. Now, in the timeline, this happens before Josiah. So David committed this heinous sin against God before Josiah. And so there, I, I was, uh, you always have to be very, very careful. You, you never want to um, speak anything extra biblically. But I, you know, I, I begin to contemplate, you know, did Josiah know about David's prayer of confession? Obviously, in the timeline of the Bible, this is written in the Psalms much later, but, you know, did Josiah know, man, I, King David, he repented of these sins. And so, put yourself, we are not David. We are not David. But as David confesses to the Lord, think about these things in light of your own life. And if we need to respond in the same way that, that David did. Have mercy on me, O God. According to your steadfast love, according to your abundant mercy. Blot out my transgressions. God, I need you to blot them out. And I'm acknowledging before you, Lord, that I have transgressed before you, is what David is saying. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity. Cleanse me from my sin. For I know, David says, my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. So he was thinking about this thing that he had done. It was, it was constantly in his mind. Do you, are, are you there? Do you struggle with something like this? Is, is your sin ever before you? Against you and you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. Church, when we sin, there are other people that are affected by our sin, but make no mistake about it, our sin is a direct slight against God. David, did he sin against Bathsheba? Yes, he did. You know, and depending on how you read the text, he might have raped her. Did he sin against her family? Yes. He had her husband, Uriah, murdered to try to cover up his indiscretions. But David doesn't say any of that here. He says, against you, God, and you only have I sinned. And so that you may be justified in your words and blameless in your judgment. David is saying, you are in complete right place to judge me according to how you see my sin, God. Behold. I was brought forth in iniquity and in sin did my mother conceive me. Behold, you delight in truth, in the inward being, and you teach me wisdom in the secret heart. Purge me, David says, with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones that you have broken rejoice. Interesting statement there. Let the bones that you have broken rejoice. Think about Job. Job didn't ask for any of that, but but God in his sovereignty, allowed Satan to attack Job in the way he did. And Job never, he he never recanted his faith. Obviously, him and God had a little conversation at the end of the book, God reminding him that he was the one that laid the foundations of the world. But the bones that you have broken rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out my iniquities. So David is, is calling out to the Lord, don't even look upon me. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence. And take not your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation. And you, God, uphold me with a willing spirit. Then I, David's saying, will teach transgressors your ways, and sinners will return to you. Deliver me from blood guiltiness, O God, O God of my salvation, and my tongue will sing aloud of your righteousness. 
O Lord, open my lips and my mouth will declare your praise. For you will not delight in sacrifice or I would give it. So David is saying, God, you're not going to delight in me doing a bunch of things for you. Because if that's what you delighted in, I would give it. Josiah, he didn't, he didn't go to the Lord and say, I'm going to tear down all these things, Lord, because I know when I do that you're going to be happy with me. He simply saw the word of God. He saw his sin or the sin of the people in light of the word of God, and he responded physically to it. David said, if, if that's what it was, if you would be pleased with a sacrifice, I would give it. But you will not be pleased with a burnt offering. So you will not delight in the sacrifice, or I would give it. You will not be pleased with the burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, which we saw that Josiah had. A broken and contrite heart, which Josiah had. David ends this sentence, O oh God, you will not despise. I know it's an interesting way to end the service, church, but maybe that's where you are. Maybe you have seen the word of God this morning and you're thinking, Lord, my sin is ever before you. Please forgive me. We go back to those passages I read near the beginning. I am God Almighty. Walk before me and be blameless. Are we walking blameless before the Lord? For I am the Lord your God. Consecrate yourselves, therefore, and be holy. For I am holy. Are we walking in that holiness? And so like David, would we call out to God for forgiveness and repentance? And like Josiah, would we respond to God's word every time we read it? Would we respond emotionally? Again, I'm not telling you to weep over, uh, over God's word physically. I'm not saying that the pages need to be wrinkled with tears. But would we respond emotionally to God's word? Would we respond physically to God's word? Would that mean actually physically unplugging the TV or physically putting this device in another room before you go to bed, okay? If, if, if you have a watch, if you have an Apple Watch, you can set an alarm on an Apple Watch, and it goes off whether the phone's around or not. Or you can go to Walmart. I think they have them for like $3. You can buy a little battery-powered alarm clock that can get you up. Put that away, whatever you need to do, physical response. Go on a mission trip with us. Lord willing, go, to us, go with us to New Orleans in June. If that's the way God is, is leading you to respond to his word. And lastly, respond spiritually. Don't respond with hardness of heart. Respond in repentance. As God reveals those sins to you, echo those words like David, God, you're, uh, my, my sin is before me. You've revealed it to me in your word. I repent of it. So a couple things when we're closing. We are born into sin. We carry the edemic curse. And our sin, though it affects others, is ultimately, as we said, against God. So if you have heard the word today and by the Spirit you're understanding your sin before a holy God, respond. Jesus will save you and make you new. It doesn't mean that life will be suddenly simple. It means that you will have hope. And so if you're in this room and you want to make that decision, come see me or one of our other staff before you leave. Or if you're watching our live stream and, and you're in that place and you're like, man, I want to know Christ, put that on, in the comments and we'll connect with you. I imagine many, if not the majority of us in here or watching on our live stream have placed our faith in Christ. And, and if that's the case, praise God for it. But in light of that, we need to repent. If we're not taking God's word seriously or the requirement of death to self seriously, we need to repent. Church has been a difficult year. It's been a difficult year, if I can confess honestly, spiritually for me. And so I've found myself in the last few weeks having to go before the Lord and say, God, I have not been the man that your word commands me to be. Forgive me. And so I'm looking forward to 2021 with going into it with, with some fresh perspective and fresh excitement. And I pray that that would be the case for you as well. But if you're hearing that and you're like, man, I'm not taking your word seriously, God, repent of that. If you're not taking the requirement of death to self seriously, repent of that, that you may know him and draw near to him. Let me pray to close this church. Father, thank you for the opportunity to proclaim your word, King Jesus. God, it is not a responsibility um, that I take lightly, nor is it a privilege that I deserve. But thank you, God, for your kindness in allowing me to do so. Jesus, I pray as we open God's word that, that as we open your word, Lord, as we read it, 
not only as we read it, but as we meditate on it, God, as we let it take root in our lives, God, that we would respond to it. Because we're responding to it every time, whether we acknowledge it or not. And that response may simply be, okay, that was a great story for today, and closing it. But God, as we read your word, I pray we would respond emotionally. I, I pray something would be stirred in us. God, that we would, maybe it's an emotion over seeing our sin rightly. God, maybe, maybe we respond emotionally when we see situations like the Good Samaritan and we think, man, I, I want to be able to, I, I, need, I need to open my eyes to see the hurt of people. Um, you know, God, maybe it's, maybe it's um, a, an emotional response. We're like, man, I, I want, you know, I, I want to invite people in my home like, like, Jesus went into the home of uh, Zacchaeus. So help us have an emotional response. God, help us to have a physical response. Maybe that response is going somewhere on missions. Maybe that response is cooking a meal for somebody, uh, raking some leaves in a yard. Maybe that response, the physical response we have simply is getting up in the mornings or putting our phone where we can't find it at night. And lastly, I pray Jesus as we read your word, that all of us in this room, all of us watching this morning would have a spiritual response bent towards repentance. God, please help us to see our sin. Help us to see it the way you do. Please help us to see ourselves rightly in light of you. God, and repent and turn from that. God, there may be people in this room or people watching who have not Maybe they haven't opened their word in months or prayed in months because they've been tired or they've been, uh, they've been emotionally beat down by what has been going on in our world. God, I pray that you would speak to them right now and let them know that you love them, but acknowledge, help them acknowledge, okay, God, not spending time in your word and praying is, is not okay. It's a sin before you. and help, Allow them to repent. God, give everybody in this room, I pray selfishly, everybody in this room, everybody watching, God, give us a longing for your word as we go into next year, God. Let, let, it, let it be the one thing that we, that we just thirst after, God, with your word and time and prayer, God. And let that not be quenched in our lives until we go there every day to find our place in your word and find our place in communion with you. We glorify King Jesus. Thank you again for time to worship you. We pray that you would be highly exalted above all things and god that we would uh that we would point people to you as we live our lives for your glory and it is the name of jesus we pray amen thank you again church for joining us this morning i uh, hope everybody has had a wonderful holiday season albeit a little bit differently a uh, reminder uh, we'll be in one service again next week um, and then we'll get information out to you again we're still navigating those waters as you are, uh, continue to pray for, um, you know, the, the cease, ceasing of this virus. <laughs> um, just trusting the Lord is going to take care of that. Obviously, um, you know, be praying for the situation in Nashville. If you saw what happened in Nashville over the, over the past couple of days, we're praying for um, the workers there as they are investigating that situation. And uh, be in prayer for your brothers and sisters who may, be, who may be just suffering from, I'm just exhausted. I'm ready for things to change, so be praying for them as well. We love you, church. Have a great day, and we will see you next week.